Hello. How, How are you? Doing? I'm good. Let me go ahead. All right. Welcome to the 10th, I think, um, release management Think Big. Uh, so last time we talked a little bit about the CICD director dashboard. This time um, we're going to have a couple of different issues. Uh, one of them being a brainstorm about uh, specifying some tags and releases work that Nathan has added to the agenda. So we'll wait for him to, to join. Um, I would like to review kind of the future of release management and give you some perspective on what I'm thinking about and we can discuss them while Nathan joins. Sound good? Perfect. And then um, feel free to add anything to the agenda as we go. So when I looked at our environment's job to be done research, we did that last month. Hayan and I interviewed a couple of customers. We had a survey go out that had 60 respondents. We learned that environments are ultra flexible. People use them in all sorts of creative ways. And it's crazy. Um, and then people don't like certain aspects of GitLab, which makes them not want to use environments. Release management's number one goal is to drive deployments out of GitLab. And if you look at the API, deployments are only tied to a specific environment. So our closest path to drive deployments is to help encourage and make using environments as easy as possible. So a couple of the quick wins that we identified one of them is making the environments dashboard like usable. So being able to pull more than seven projects and more than three environments. This will really help uh, users be able to see all of their environments across their project. And then the other one is sharing environments at the group level. So this means if I have a target URL named production in project A and a target URL named prod and it's the same URL in project B, these would currently show up on the environment's dashboards as two separate environments, even though the URL is the same. So us being able to bridge that gap and share that environment across the group will be really powerful for our users. So that's kind of the, the first two things that we should be knocking out to help make environments more usable for our users. The next piece that I'd like us to start thinking about is release generation. Now that we have that MVC of being able to generate a release from the CLI that Jaime created, we can start expanding that CLI to have release versioning, an auto change log, and uploading assets. Well, the last thing with release orchestration is the releases page user experience. So a couple of things about this. Right now, we have duplicative pages. When you look at the release page in the project, it looks the exact same as the release page view once you click into that particular tag. There's an opportunity that we have here to be more competitive and allow our users to see different details about a release. For example, is this release to a particular production environment? Is this release scheduled across a different like a deploy freeze? Is this in a particular group milestone or in just a project milestone? So by allowing us to provide more usable insights at a different level, uh, whether that's project or group, and then give people the detailed view once they click into that particular release name is something that we really have to kind of parse and figure out. Then of course we have secrets management and release evidence. These two items are kind of in parallel with release orchestration um, and they're pretty minimal right now. So we're just thinking about how do we build up our HashiCorp integration and then the other one is making release evidence more usable for the auditor. So for this Think Big, I'd like us to dive into either the release page UX or talk a little bit more about environments as we wait for Nathan to join. Does that sound good? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jackie. That's awesome. Um, I've got to say the environments issue is quite interesting to me because I've, 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 I've always found it um, not confusing, but 
slightly uh, unintuitive the way that environments work. Uh, where, where the environments don't really know about each other and also that environments are not really, um, you know, you can have any number of environments, right? There's not really a clear definition of this is the production environment and this is the staging environment as you might have in Heroku or something like that. And so, you know, that, that obviously offers a lot of flexibility to customers. I mean, they might want to even have multiple, you know, but, but to not have, um, to not know which one is the production environment, that was a question that we raised um, when, when looking at um, the, the, the blackout windows. That was, you know, a bit strange that we don't have that definition, I think. And so I guess, I guess the question is, you know, is, is that a, is that something that customers are always asking? Or also asking, um, you know, do we know which environment means what, or, or, or do we, should we keep this flexibility that we currently have and not, not upset the Apple card? That's a super good question. So in a future job to be done iteration that Hyana and I are working on from a research perspective, the biggest question that I have to customers is how important it, how important is it to know what your environment's being used for? And I would say that number one, most of our customers are using the name to distinguish the environment. So prod, or they have a URL that is named prod, like they have prod dot whatever URL location. So those are the kinds of ways that they're using to identify the production environment. Making that more native in GitLab could be a really positive user experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, comparing to Heroku, I mean, mm -hmm. they have this situation where they have these environment pipelines, or they call them pipelines, where, you know, this is your production environment. And then, the, and then you might have a staging environment that directly feeds into the production environment. It's, it's solving a different problem there. Well, what they're solving is, you know, compilation of assets and, um, you know, to reduce the, um, the, the, the release time. Um, but it's just, it's just really clear that this is your production environment and, and, and these other environments are peripheral to, or they might even feed into it. Um, again, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's also something that's only applicable to a smaller site. And because we're using Kubernetes, you know, we have a different view, but, um, it is a simple approach. It's easy to understand, I must say. I think that's good. Um, I would like to, maybe we can open up an issue and yeah. start uh, kind of landing some of the competitive analysis with our Heroku here and see what the community has to say about it. Because maybe that will be something that uh, would be really meaningful. Something I'm struggling with when it comes to the environments dashboard is how do we create like a deploy board for companies that aren't using Kubernetes, you know, like how can that's, we, yeah. That, that's such a great question, Jackie, because, um, you know, the whole world went to Kubernetes and however, there has been a little bit of a backlash um, lately because it's just so complex. And um, so, you know, how do we support other deployment methods uh, in the way that we're native, you know, we're so natively supporting Kubernetes. Um, but not lose that focus as well, because I think it is a real big advantage for us. And I think what might be a good fork in the road is if the configure team handles all of this cloud native deployment with auto deploy. And if we figure out the more um, not cloud native releases, <laughs> I think that that might be a good way to ensure that we're still K8 first, but then we have this multi cloud um, support from a release orchestration standpoint, because that's the biggest thing that analysts are going to be looking at is how do we stack up against tools like electric cloud and Jenkins and, uh, and ZP labs who really don't care what your target is. Uh, mm -hmm. And how can we see those tasks regardless of what you're planning to deploy with. So that's a good, a good point there. And, and a lot of it we might already have. I mean, our CD is, is basically so powerful and flexible that, I mean, you can more or less put anything in, in there as scripts. And, um, and so maybe a part of supporting other platforms or other deployment methods is simply a matter of documentation and producing examples. I'm not sure if that all falls within our group, but you know, uh, as, as GitLab um, as a whole, um, you know, templates even, I don't know, but 
you know, an easy way to get from um, your, your development code to a production environment. Because what we're seeing when we look at the relationship between deployments created and releases created, we see two lines. We see releases are right under deployments. So people are denoting a particular deployment with a release object. So the best way for us to increase the number of releases is to create the object by which they're denoting and improve that. So I think empowering these multi-cloud deployments more effectively, we'll start naturally seeing people leverage the releases features more and create more releases because they're gonna be denoting more periods in time. And GitLab that is, because we, we have this whole part of the user base that we learned from the environment's job to be done that aren't deploying with GitLab. And it's because they can't see where they're deploying to and it's much easier to go to AWS native to see their environment um, rather than yes, yeah it. that's a huge that's a huge opportunity for us to to do that yeah well even, even our own examples um, again just going back to Kubernetes we don't have a lot of examples deploying to Kubernetes you know all they're extremely simple you know they're like um, toy applications. And, and see, and Kubernetes is really, you know, I think the experience is showing us that it's actually great for larger, more complex customers. Yeah, because more customers that are smaller are more likely to deploy using ECS or another exactly. container um, yeah. because those are easier to manage from a resource perspective, like they're not as expensive. Um, so indicating like that connection could be, could be interesting, yeah. Completely agree with that. Um, anything else on this environment's job to be done? Any other questions? More to come on this as Hyan and I un uncover different kinds of pain points. I do have a user insights epic that I'll link here if you're curious about what our, what our customers actually said. Uh, yeah. and how I actually interviewed them. I'll definitely provide that information. Um, Hyanna, I think you bolded the releases page UX. Do you want to dive into that topic? Yeah, I was, I'm thinking about um, how we want to, in a way, try to prioritize uh, this, uh, uh, the improvements um, on what I think is going to be like a split view. Um, the releases page and I don't have all my thoughts organized yet but I want us to talk about and uh, a little bit about the personas uh, Jackie they are the consumer of the release uh, this overview because um, we talk about the jobs to be done but I'm, I'm really interested in seeing what and, and trying to identify what are the tasks that those these people will try to complete in this view uh, so that we don't create friction once we start incrementally adding this uh, changes to the to the UI, so it's more of a thought. <laughs> oh no, I love this. This is such a good question. What personas are we trying to tackle by separating these two views? So, I would say that all of the conversations that I've had, I've had about six to seven interviews with customers that are very focused on managing teams, whether this is a development team lead or a release manager or perhaps a platform engineer that are in a matrix environment that are just trying to see what is the progress of the things that I'm working on. And sometimes the progress of the things that I'm working on are not in the same group. They're not in the same project. They're not in the same uh, instance. So building out more visibility that we can create connections for users using the architecture that GitLab offers today so more intuitively, providing aggregated views of the release page at a project level would help this development team lead or release manager or platform engineer persona be able to target, triage, and dig into details as needed. So if we think about the task, I'm starting my day, I wanna see what trash cans are on fire, I want to see what things are not on fire and I want to triage those items accordingly. 
they would go to that project releases page, see what are all the releases are doing, or they'd go to the releases group page and see what those releases are doing. And what about permissions? Um, we talked a little bit about reading text, right? <laughs> Going back to the, um, the issue that we had with uh, the, the change in permissions and tags and not being able to see, um, oh my God, the evidence. <laughs> yeah. Um, what are the, 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 like the low hanging fruits or the things that we can think of regarding of visibility and then security for, for these views? One, one thing that came up recently about um, well, I read recently, having come back from two week vacation, um, is that um, this question of, you know, so we collect evidence, possibly multiple evidence objects per, per, um, per release, uh, um, and then we um, delete the release. And so what happens to the evidence? The evidence is the order trail. And so I think that I think the decision, well, certainly the comments in the issue um, were that we should keep the evidence, um, which is, of course, fine. Um, what it does mean though is we'd have to have a different way to access the evidence through the UI because we've no longer got the tag. And then who would have access to that? Possibly only the auditor role. Yeah, like how, how do we handle orphaned evidence? Yeah. Um, I wonder if we don't allow people to access it in the UI and it only becomes an API. Yeah, that's well, that, that actually is the, is the simplest approach. And, and I guess we need to consider how frequently would this happen and, and who needs to access it because they can always access it through the API. What I would probably say is that it's an undesirable behavior to delete releases. So this could be one way to deter that behavior is that, hey, once you delete it, you still have your release evidence, but mind you, you have to, you will have to retrieve that from the API and then figure out how you're going to diff that release file from a different mm -hmm. release file. Yeah. You won't be able to leverage the, the native capabilities that will eventually offer in release evidence. I know we don't necessarily compare ourselves to um, GitHub, but I think you can delete a release on GitHub, can you? Yep. You can. Okay, interesting. Yeah, you can delete a release, but you, I don't think you can delete a tag. Right. So the, that tag will still show up in that releases page, but you can delete like your associated stuff with it. Welcome, Nathan. How are you? Yeah. <laughs> so good. <laughs> can I ask a quick question before we move into Nathan's point? Um, just on what Sean said about comparison to GitHub. Um, with the whole um, SID challenge recently of the GitLab versus GitHub uh, for users, I'm just curious, um, are we putting more of an emphasis on like features that keep us competitive across versus um, prioritizing, you know, market differentiators? I was just curious if that has changed recently. So Typically, release management is very focused on competing against the current market leaders in release orchestration. So this is going to be Zebia Labs, Electric Cloud, and some Jenkins stuff as we get more into the CD capabilities of release orchestration. So GitHub has not been a priority for my, my focus as our team looks into this, but I think that's because I came in right as we implemented the releases API and the releases API was meant to be the response to being able to create tags and releases, which is how GitHub does it. You know, like you create releases from tags. Mm -hmm. uh, so GitHub is not a priority, but I would say other competitors in the release management space are. And I would say about 30% of our milestone planned work is about prospects and getting more prospects in any given milestone. And then the remainder of the work is usually existing customers, whether that's bugs, tech debt, or feature enhancements for existing users. Great, that's helpful, thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think in many ways, we're, we're, I mean, we're, we're still, the product is still needs maturity, but in many ways, the feature set is already, it's already surpassed what GitHub's offering. Um, we need a bit more polish, but we'll get there. And actually, I think uh, one of the things that uh, Michael, who's on the call with us right now, inspired me to create was this issue about supporting GitHub releases in GitLab releases. So finding a way to like import your GitHub releases into GitLabs. Um, and this is one way we're like, we're not competing. We're more like just trying to make the best developer experience possible where no matter where you manage your code. And I think that that's that's one approach that I would say, contrary to competing, is just how do we provide the best experience? It, it, it's a good point because if, if we, you know, if we want to encourage people to, for example, migrate from GitHub, and if, you know, if, if, the, if the releases structure that's there can be, you know, can map into something that we, that we have, um, you know, without losing data or without breaking anything, then I think that's definitely a plus. Which kind of goes back to what Hayana's question was, which is what what persona are we focusing on? Like right now, we're kind of focusing on this. How do I work across plan enterprise level releases? And then maybe we'll dive back into the developer experience. And this is where we'll start competing more head to head with GitHub. Um, Art, I wanted to add, um, if, we are not, if you're not only targeting customers, but also open source developers, you always have the problem that gitlab.com is not so social and they will be hosting their source code on github.com, but they may have some mirroring or something else in place and may see the benefit to like uh, use gitlab.com as the primary resource and have the possibility, for example, to sync the releases to GitHub, which would be a cool thing. Okay. Yeah, and so I think, I think, um... I mean, given that our feature set is in release management is, is I think already bigger than what GitHub do offer. Um, I guess it's just a matter of considering whether, you know, we can actually directly map their feature set onto what we have. And, um, you know, we, then of course we can consider other, you know, uh, Atlassian, for example, Bitbucket, but I guess GitHub is the main one that we're probably focusing on. Yeah. It's a good call out though, Nicole. I think uh, I try to do once a quarter a deep dive into a competitor. This quarter has been CloudBeast. So maybe next quarter I can look more at the tools that we're seeing people leaving when they come from GitLab and maybe GitHub will be that tool and then we can kind of evaluate what that looks like. Uh, let's see, let me check the time. Nathan, do we want to dive into a couple of your issues? Sure, yeah. Um, I just wanted to kind of call up my one point that I wrote there is I'm curious, we kind of seem like we're building a lot of like planning and, and overview kind of functionality into releases or that's what we're talking about. But we already have milestones and we have a lot of other stages that deal with that. So I, I think we need to be a little cautious about not like trying to do to pack the entire software cycle into releases like we can like if, if there's something that milestones provides, we don't need to rebuild that into releases. Like I'm not really sure it makes sense to be for releases to be the place where people go to plan their daily work. I completely um, agree that, with you. Yeah. So anyway, that was kind of my, my only comment there. I think what's good is that we do have a recurring meeting with uh, Gabe Weaver over plan and it's called milestone and releases. That's the heading of the meeting. And what we do is we talk about like, where is the intersection of releases and milestones and how do we cross link the two? I think mm -hmm. my perspective is how do we give people information about releases on the release project page and not the view page. So for example, say that the releases project page just has like four boxes of number of active releases, number of upcoming releases, number of releases with release evidence, and then it lists out the release tags with their progress views. And then you have to click into that release name to see the other details like the change log, the release evidence. Um, I don't really feel that we need to include anything beyond the release progress view. 
because I feel like that gives us all the information we need from a planning perspective for release managers and it gives them the opportunity to link off into the planning stage more. Cool. Yeah. Uh Yeah, and I just want also to highlight this, that uh, I think it would be nice for us to define a UX goal, both UX and front-end goals, to the objectives of this uh, redesign, because I see this as a redesign. It's going <laughs> to, to some people, it's going to add friction to their, to their workflow. Um, so I think once we, we set this, this overall goal for what we want to be doing here, it's going to be easier to have conversations about how we want to solve these problems in different ways like cross-linking information or just reusing some existing capabilities. Um, and I would prefer, if it were up to me, I would prefer not to just incorporate things from other stage groups because they usually come with bad UX or a lot of bugs. So if we can um, look into, for example, um, linking, making a, a, like what we do now, there's a counter of how many issues, emerging class or deployments you have in your specific release right? But then we link that to the milestone overview where you can see all that detailed data. I think that's a, that's a good low hanging fruit for us rather than completely agree with Nathan filling in the, the empty bag with the just random um, data points. Yeah, I think we need to kind of see what's the intersection of the users who are using releases without milestones because this is where we may need to run a campaign on how to plan releases with milestones. And that might be a blog post or a couple of webinars that we just publish on Unfiltered that drive the, uh, the action of associating milestones and releases. And I think we'll probably see that once we finally offer that in the web UI too. Um, but that could, be some, that could be one of the reasons why we are seeing releases without milestones too which means they're not being, they're not able to take advantage of the planning features. But I agree, Hannah, that we don't wanna add bad UX into the releases page. And it will cause friction once we change this because every change does. Okay. I think Nathan, you had this other issue down here. With the yeah, I, I've been meaning to create an issue for this. Um, but I just had no time. One thought I had, um, since we're trying to increase the adoption of our stage, um, right now, uh, all our releases have to be kind of manually created or like created from the CI. Um, whereas, for example, GitHub, they automatically create, they, they populate that releases page with tags. Um, and there's kind of good and bad to that, but one, one way to kind of get the best of both worlds might be to have a setting somewhere um, that says automatically create releases when a tag matches this wildcard. Um, and then you could set up a little, like a wildcard that matches your version tags. And then your releases page would automatically be populated with releases if a tag is created that matches that wildcard. Um, and so that would automatically um, just start, like people would be able to start using it right away without actually going and creating releases. So that could be a way to, to increase adoption of, of the releases page. Yeah, and we have a lot of the back end in place to do that already. I mean, we, we can create, um, you know, just from a, we can, you know, we can create the tag just from, um, from the hash and, uh, yeah, I think we could, yeah. Cool. I love this idea. I think more automation that we can support this will kind of opt people into releases, which is great. Yeah. Um, I love that. Uh, I do I do think though, I wonder how many users are going to start leveraging release creation from the YAML file once we bake that release CLI fully. And I wonder if that will start minimizing um, the manual actions that people are going through creating tags and associating releases after the fact. Yeah, that yeah, that's a good point because we don't want to have multiple ways of creating things and it could be confusing if you have you're creating things through the CI and you also have this auto creation behavior turned on. So, right. Yeah. So we just might want to balance that and think if the wild card will be the preferred way. I think what I've heard from customers, um, the dev persona mostly is that the YAML file will be their primary way of creating tags and releases, but that might be because they haven't 
seeing other options? Well, the thing about using a, a, a wildcard and a, and a you know, regex is um, not everyone follows Zenbear, right? They might follow another, you know, so we could, we could try and work out what would be the most popular methodologies. Um, but I think one of the really strong features of GitLab is it doesn't lock you in anywhere really, like it constantly allows you to, to do what you want. With that, of course, goes a bit of extra complexity, but yeah, that's, um, yeah. I, I, I do like the idea of having a single source of truth, essentially, as you're saying, Jackie. Um, but a UI element could still somehow work off that. I don't know, we'll see how that goes. Like we could have a UI element that essentially um, somehow populates the, the YAML or, um, or links to it like we've done with the um deploy freezes yes yeah, so thank you yeah we had like a little Scrappy. esp, ESP moment there I, I saw this i was like it's it's a deploy freeze headache <laughs> <laughs> it's getting light in the day for me <laughs> no i i yeah i i can i feel that i can relate um okay i think that one part that i remember us having a conversation about was uh, that relationship between the UI creating things in the YAML can be problematic for our system or tool today. Um, I think that was a previous conversation that we had. So it sounded like that might be something that we want to avoid and have either in the YAML or the UI, but maybe that's not true. Maybe that was a me misunderstanding. No, you're completely correct, actually. Um, I think maybe I phrased that wrong. I think the, what, the approach that we ended up with with the deploy freeze was actually great, where we had the YAML considers something that's on the configuration page. Right. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Um, all right. I think we still have some time to talk about your associating releases with group milestones issue, Nathan. Uh, yeah, that's just um, the only reason I am interested in that in particular is because it would allow us to start dog fooding all of our issue summary stuff that we built. Um, on gitlab.com because we use group milestones. So, and I, I would guess that that's, I guess I don't know, but I feel like group milestones would be more common than project milestones. Um, I yeah. feel like a lot of organizations would do it like we do. So it would just be a big win to be able to dog food that. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that. I think we weighted it at a three for, for weights, but I, I think Kraz literally said, I don't know how much, I don't know much about group releases, but setting weight to three. So that's, that inspires a lot of confidence there. Um, so this might so this be something. So this issue is, is different though, because this is Project adding one. like a group level release page. Whereas I'm more talking about having even a project level release associating with, with a group milestone. So it'd be great if, releases could be connected to group level milestones. Oh, okay. So maybe it's support releases at the group level. Okay. So maybe that title's misleading. Okay. Yeah. So that is, that is right then. Because we can't really create a release at the group level because there's no repository at the group level. Right. So it yep. has to be at the project level. Um, but I can change this name so that it's clearer. Yeah. Because I just I just assume that releases will always have to live at the project level and that the release group page will be an overview of releases and milestones or how, if we if we even create a releases group page, right? Right, right. Um, good call out there. I promise I type better than this. <laughs> so all, great, it's okay. It's the pressure of all of us watching you. It's okay. <laughs> I was like, I took a typing test. I know I can type. It's okay. Have faith in me. Um, all right. Let's let me find our multiple tabs there. Okay. So here's the the issue. I would be open to, to seeing if one of our teammates would be cool with picking this up in 13.1. Um, this could be a really big do dog fooding value add, uh, but I also don't want to pressure people into picking it up. I can also schedule it for you know 13.2 or we can 
consider it a candidate for this current milestone if people's work frees up. Because I, I do agree, like this will help our dog fooding effort. It'll also help Philip Hasper, who is one of my buddies that I brainstorm with who uses our feature. Um, so I think that that's a really good call out, Nathan. Cool. Um, and then my second point there, we have talked about this so many times, but just kind of thinking more through the, the association between tags and releases. So this is one just today that someone was confused by why in a guest user of a private project, when they saw the releases page, it was all, the release names are all kind of generic and mangled. But again, it's because they, can, they can't see tag information. <clears throat> so it's kind of this recurring issue with them being tied so closely together. Um, and not to mention, we did have a deprecation notice from Alessio that said that we were going to be deprecating tags and releases. Yeah, did he ever respond to that? Like, did he ever give a, a reason why he, that he said that? He couldn't link me to a specific issue. So I'm still trying to find like the releases page MVC, I think is what he said was like the originator of this request. Um, let me see if I can pull that up. That, that was his only response on the MR. So I'll Google that. But when I looked at that issue, I couldn't see like, oh, what, the reason why we needed to, um, to dis disconnect it. Mm -hmm. so I'll drop this issue. Sometimes those decisions are just there somewhere in the comment section. Yeah, I like briefly went through. Because uh, I'm, not, I'm not across this particular issue, but that, that's a fairly large change, right? Like mm -hmm. separating the, the release from the tag. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be really, really big. But there's there's two things in particular that are were kind of are, are kind of incompatible with the way we're doing it now. And one is upcoming releases, which really don't make sense if you have to tie it to an existing tag. Um, and so that's always been kind of odd to me. And then also guest access because they can't access tag information. So like those two, two things I think are, are limitations of the tight, the tight, um, uh, association between the two. Um, so maybe yeah. it's, maybe it's too heavy handed of a solution for those two edge cases, but. So, so, yeah. so but we would, we would have a, like a release ID or something that would be completely different from the tag. Yep, I think so. I think what okay. I'm kind of thinking that the best solution would be is to use the release, the Rails ID as the primary key, mm -hmm. kind of like we do for issues and merge requests and all that. Um, and then to allow in the URL, you can, you can route it using either the tag or maybe like a version, if we ever introduce a version concept, mm -hmm. um, you can still reference that in the URL with that. Um, and that would kind of allow us to migrate from like the associate, the tight association with tags to something like that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we could definitely do it that way. I think it would be a fairly big architectural change. Um, cause we're so, we're so driven by tag at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess, I, I guess my question was be what, yes, we could do it, but what, what, why do we want to do it? So the two main issues are. Today, you associate, you, you artificially create a release and a tag to then later recreate your release with the final tag in order to have like an upcoming release. So our release progress view is only as good as the tag being created today. And then you have a milestone associated to that release so it can populate percent complete, but that tag doesn't indicate what's actually contained within that release because mm. it's just a random tag and commit, right? It's not truly yeah. upcoming. <laughs> it's like a fake tag. Yeah, um, cause that's supposed to be like the snapshot. The tag is like the snapshot of the release. So it's, it's not the, that isn't the snapshot. It's that's upcoming. So yeah. So that's, I that's, wonder if I'd love to know the background behind this because I'm wondering if this is supposed to mirror the 
the feature of GitHub, which is called pre-release, which in the snapshot something is a pre-release, but it's still it's still a release. Um, and if that's the case, maybe we're just being thrown off by the wording. Like maybe because a pre-release does make sense to assign to a tag. Um, because it, because it's, it's a version. Upcoming, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. It's what we're calling an upcoming release, right? Pre-release. Yeah, but a pre-release is actually snapshot and released. It's like this is the pre-release, whereas an upcoming release implies it's not yet released. So. Yeah, I have to provide you with some context. I actually uh, worked on this at EP12.1, so that was, I don't know, last year. And uh, we even had to um, send out some like a survey for people to uh, tell what they understood from upcoming release, pre-release, whatever. There was a lot of confusion regarding uh, um, the naming for this. And by the time, if I remember correctly, we didn't discuss like when the tag would be created, uh, where, you know, it's uh, taking creating snapshots, etc. I don't think this was taken into account for the MVC. Um, and yeah, let me add the link here as well to the documentation. Interesting. That's really good content. I'm, I'll read through that because I'm really curious how this came about. Oh, hi, Anna. Did I just butcher what you're doing? Sorry. So I would say the only benefits that we get by disassociating, not the only benefits, but the two primary benefits that we get by disassociating, disassociating releases from tags are that we can create, truly create upcoming releases, meaning it is a shell of what will eventually have a tag associated to it, whether that's a pre-release tag or an actual, right now we've deployed a change tag. And then the second one is guest, guest access to releases. So there's two use cases for guest access. One of them is I am an embedded software project in GitLab and I don't want people to have access to my source code, but I want them to be able to download artifacts or assets. So I want to be able to publish my releases to people that are not in my project to then download things. Um, there's also the second use case for inner sourcing. Again, want to publish artifacts, want to give people an update that these things are now available. Um, and maybe this is already a change that's deployed to everybody's device or everybody's um, intranet, but it's more like a, here's a, a release that's been published and created, but no actions required. So we would be serving the two major groups that are currently consuming our releases today with both of those changes. Okay, yeah, there's an opportunity there then. And with inner sourcing, I'm starting to see a lot of overlap with air gapped companies. So air gapped companies might leverage releases to publish binaries for their teams to use so that they're not connected to a Wi-Fi or internet. Mm -hmm. okay. so yeah, anyway, the, the gist of it is I'm not sure, those are those two issues. And I don't know if those two issues warrant such a major architectural change, um, but it's just something to think about. Yeah, I think it does, we should probably have a, d a deeper dive on this team, um, specifically about maybe we can talk to maintainer or Alessio or somebody who, who's a, who was a part of the original conversation, because I wouldn't be necessarily super gung-ho about doing this re-architecture if it wasn't decided before that we should deprecate this relationship, but the fact that somebody else decided it kind of makes me think that this was something that we should consider to also resolve these two issues that you've linked here, Nathan. Yeah, uh, one note about that deprecation. So the way I understood it, he, he was mentioning that we're deprecating creating a release and tag at the same time, not necessarily the association between the two. It was more just the, the process of creating the, that was being deprecated. So that might be a slightly different issue. Okay, got it. For some reason, when I think about how people are creating releases, a tag is so important to it, to their use case. 
I don't know if that's just because of how we've offered it and that's just what they're used to or if it's because they really need those two together. So that's my only like, we, we should always be able to associate a tag to a release, but the creation aspect I think is my fear is that people are so used to creating a tag with a release. Okay. So I have scheduled a follow-up meeting with Tim later this week, I think. Uh, the package team wants to collaborate on a, a feature set uh, for releases. And Nathan, this kind of goes to what you were talking about with allowing semantic version of releases and potentially combining some of the package page and the release pages together. Uh, so we'll unpack that with them in their meeting with ThinkBig. And hopefully we can start talking about like a, a distribution model for releases too. So that might be, that'll be a very interesting and compelling use case to solve as well. Um, I did have this item here about adding group repositories. So I've seen this four times in the past three weeks a um, couple of customers are asking for us to support group level YAML files, group level pipelines, group level code. And I think what this is about is enforcing permissions a, high, a higher level than the project so that people can take the YAML file from the group and extend it uh, in a project. And it's a weird thing that we get pulled into it, but the end point is I want to continuous, continuously deploy and have my projects in a group all deploy the same way using this YAML file. But then I want to empower each of the projects to be able to extend that YAML file for their own stages between deployments. So wanted to flag that here to get your thoughts on it. And I have a couple of issues open with both the Verify team and the Manage team and Compliance team. I think we can save this one till next time because we have two minutes left. Are there any other topics or thoughts? Okay. So to recap, um, I think, Sean, if you could create an issue I had up here. for something. Um, oh yeah, for Heroku. Ah, uh, yes, yep. In environments. Um, I will also create a couple of follow-up issues um, and add them to our backlog from the ThinkBig. One of them being Nathan, your wildcard thing. And if you beat me to it, that's okay. Just ping me on it. <laughs> but otherwise, I'll create this issue and ping you on it. Um, and then, Hayana, you and I will continue talking about the persona with the release page breakout. Sound good? Okay. Perfect. Was this still useful? Did this accomplish what you thought it would? Yeah, it's great. Okay, good. Let me know how else we can improve it in our channel. All right, y'all. Well, thank you so much Ciao. for your time. We'll talk soon. Bye.